In one of our recent videos, we covered the histories, purpose and architectural achievements of the seven wonders of the ancient world. The Giza Pyramid, Colossus of Rhodes, Hanging Gardens, Statue of Zeus, Pharos of Alexandria, Mausoleum of Halicarnassus, and the Temple of Artemis. There are so many more great marvels to cover, we decided to make a second episode on the topic with seven more lesser known wonders from days that are long gone. Welcome to our video covering a host of ancient wonders that you might not have heard about. And the modern age has its share of wonders too, there's the internet and its erstwhile companion NordVPN. You probably know about using NordVPN to encrypt data and bypass regional restrictions, but now they've added a feature you can use with or without the VPN called Threat Protection. It deletes dangerous files that try to automatically download themselves, or those hiding behind fake links, before any damage can be done. It warns you when a site is potentially unsafe, a phishing scam, or is going to harvest your data, and similarly it blocks web trackers that create data profiles specifically about you, enhancing your anonymity and privacy. It's like adding custom antivirus software into the NordVPN package. Just click a button in the corner of the Nord window and engage the new protections, and they remain effective whether you're using a VPN or not. It's included in the price, so if you have NordVPN you can use it now. Or if not, then we have an exclusive offer for our viewers. Get a two-year plan and an extra month for free at nordvpn.com slash kingsandgenerals. It's all risk-free with their 30-day money-back guarantee. Match me with such marvel save in eastern clime, a rose-red city half as old as time, goes the final couplet of John William Bergen's Petra. But what actually was Petra, and how did it come to be? Most people have seen the signature photograph of a marvellous colonnaded entranceway-like structure carved into a mountainside in southern Jordan, but the story of Petra and its proper scale are often ignored. With an area of over 100 square miles between and within a series of mountains and hills, Petra was the capital and greatest city of the ancient Nabataean Kingdom, a mercantile Arab realm located in the northwestern part of Arabia. Over the course of 400 years between the ages of Ptolemy I and Trajan, Nabataean rulers seized control over vital trade routes and became prodigiously rich as middlemen in the trade of vital products such as incense. This phenomenal wealth allowed Nabataean rulers to construct the magnificent buildings and monuments that we see at Petra today. When modern visitors arrive at the complex, they travel through a kilometre-long gorge known as Al Sikh in the southeastern segment. When they reach the other end, the gorge opens to reveal what appears at first to be the aforementioned entrance to a Lord of the Rings-esque Dwarven mountain city. This most awe-inspiring of Petra's remains is actually known as al Khazneh, the Treasury, and is thought to be the mausoleum of Nabataean monarch Atreus IV, although its purpose is still a mystery. It was made by architecture in reverse excavating and hollowing out the space between walls and columns in stone that already existed, rather than building them from nothing. Initially, al was painted with rich colour, but that has worn away over the centuries. But the treasury is only one of the several dozen prominent sites within the bounds of Petra. As a religious centre, several temples were present, as were festival theatres, bathhouses, titanic gates, houses, further royal tombs, pools, waterworks, and even a number of Christian churches, constructed after the Nabataean Kingdom's absorption into the Roman Empire by 106 AD. Other trade routes surmounted Petra in late antiquity, and an earthquake in 363 damaged a number of structures. By the Islamic period, the city was all but abandoned. In order to discover our next great world wonder, we must voyage all the way east to the city of Xi'an in China. In 1974, at the base of nearby Mount Li, a group of Chinese well diggers discovered shards of earthenware, terracotta and arrowheads. Through years of subsequent excavation and study, this find would eventually be identified as the tomb of the first emperor of China, Qin Shi Huangdi. This imperial grave was, according to Edward Berman, 
conceived on a scale more massive than any other monument at that stage of human history. Throughout his notoriously stringent reign, the emperor employed a total of perhaps 700,000 conscripted laborers to construct his magnificent tomb complex. The core tumulus originally stood at 115 meters tall, and was enclosed by double walls, inside which were large temples, imperial halls, and administrative buildings. But the most iconic feature of the emperor's tomb is undoubtedly the army of so-called terracotta warriors, discovered to the east of the primary mound. Although discovered in many pieces, like a giant jigsaw puzzle, each of those pieces was astonishingly well preserved, a fact which allowed restorationists to piece them back together. Over 8,000 figures have been discovered and rearranged so far, each one possessing individual details such as hand position and hairstyle. This includes 130 chariots drawn by 520 horses, and a further 150 horses for cavalrymen. The presence of terracotta civil officials, acrobats, strongmen, poets and musicians indicates that it was designed to give Qin Shi Huangdi everything he might need in a life after this one. Dashing back over to the chief land of all antiquities, Egypt, we find an extraordinary gem which is often lost among the more well-known sites. In September 1900, a stone-hauling donkey misstepped and fell into a hole in the ground. Its owner sent word to the local Alexandria Museum that he had broken open the vault of a subterranean tomb. Tired of bogus finds, the curator sent his assistants instead, but what they found, the so-called catacombs of Komel Shokafa, would occupy that curator for the rest of his life. Archaeologists believe that this catacomb was used since the 2nd century AD as part of a necropolis on Alexandria's western side to intern the dead for the next 200 years before falling into disuse as the Roman Empire fell on hard times. Perhaps the most stunning aspect of this particular complex is the close intermingling of Egyptian, Greek and Roman styles of art, and even method of burial. From the remains of what was probably a funerary chapel of some kind, runs a windowed 6 meter wide shaft traversed by a spiral staircase, which leads into the tomb itself about 10 meters underground. Between the base of the stairs and the top underground level, there is a foyer area with stone-carved chairs where visitors might have rested. A brief passage from there would take a visitor to a circular antechamber which is itself adjacent to the triclinium, a banquet hall used in feasts to honour the dead. After descending a flight of stairs from the rotunda room, a visit would pass a pronaus or colonnaded porch into a labyrinth-like series of corridors containing burial niches on either side. This section resembles something like a traditional Greek temple, and it serves as the main area of the entire catacomb. Below this middle tier, there is a third level containing even more burial niches. However, this entire section is flooded and inaccessible. Unique art engraved into the middle level of the tombs is what truly makes the catacomb a wonder. One author said that the catacomb was visible evidence of an age when three cultures, three arts and three religions were superimposed upon Egyptian soil, a fact which makes it unique in the ancient world. Also unique in its diversity of civilizational influence is what may be perhaps the most well-known but misunderstood institution in all of Alexandria, the Great Library. Its point of origin was the early Hellenistic period, when Ptolemy I commissioned Demetrius of Phalerum to establish a library at his capital. It would be a grand universal nexus of scholarship where all written works of the world would be assembled. In a greater library precinct, which was probably but not certainly located next to a port near the central city, were two distinct institutions with a broad overlap of purpose. The Museon, or Museum, dedicated to the Muses, was the equivalent of what we might describe as a research institute, which brought together great scholars. Then there was the library itself, a place of books and scrolls, which expanded by the patronage of Ptolemy's successors to become the world's greatest collection of knowledge. 
Ptolemy III is said to have treated with the other kingdoms and empires across the world, asking them to lend their books for copying into his universal library. Galen also tells us that Alexandrian customs officials were ordered to confiscate any books that were found on any ship coming into port, so by 250 BC, it possessed over 400,000 multiple work scrolls and another 90,000 single scrolls. At least one daughter library was created, the most well known of which was the Serapeion, housed within the syncretic Greco-Egyptian god Serapis. What exactly happened to the library is shrouded in myth, however it probably began to decline as its patron dynasty's fortunes did, in around 100 BC or thereabouts. Julius Caesar famously and accidentally burned part of the library in 48 BC, destroying part of the collection. A rebellion and subsequent counterattack during the reign of Aurelian saw further disruption, and in 391, the Serapeion was sacked by Christians during the reign of Theodosius I. Moving to Mesopotamia, we have a wealth of possible candidates, such as the restored Ziggurat of Ur, However, still standing in its weathered but original form after almost 1,500 years is the last glorious remnant of Sassanid Persian glory, the Tek Kisra, or Arch of Khosrau. It was constructed in the late 550s for the Sassanid monarch Khosrau I as the centerpiece of his new palace. Although this era was one of warfare between Khosrau and the Byzantines, Experts from Constantinople were dispatched to assist the Shah in the palace's development. The masterful arch is around 35 meters in height and 25 meters wide, originally covering a hall 50 meters in length, although much of that hall has collapsed over the centuries. Uniform bricks of 30 by 12 centimeters squared and 7.5 by 3 centimeters thick were utilized along with a swiftly drying form of gypsum cement. To construct the lower walls, these bricks were laid horizontally and then turned to tilt on their edge for the arching section itself, a sophisticated architectural method known as the pitched brick technique. While the core design of both the palace and its highlight arch were essentially Sassanid in nature, the columned palace facades flanking it, which formed and still form part of the wider palace structure, were Greco-Roman in style. Even so, the skills necessary to construct an arch on Tesiphon's scale were, at their root, Mesopotamian in origin. Lesser predecessors can be found as far back as 2500 BC, or even before, when the technique was used to build small roofs from mud brick. When the Arab armies captured the Sassanid capital in 637 AD, they used the former throne room as a mosque, but quickly abandoned the city as it was not to their liking. Even 200 years later, the Tak Kisra was still dubbed most beautiful of any brick palace that ever existed. It is so resilient that, although undermined by flooding over the hundreds of years since, even modern explosive weaponry detonating nearby hasn't succeeded in demolishing the arch. It remains today, along with a single palace facade. In about 1850, far to the north of Tesiphon, on the upper reaches of the Tigris River, English explorer Austin Henry and his staff unearthed a series of depository chambers designed to store engraved tablets, a traditionally Mesopotamian equivalent of paper books. This hoard on the site of Old Nineveh, which was expanded in subsequent excavations, became known as the Library of Ashurbanipal. Ashurbanipal, king of the Neo-Assyrian Empire, is most notorious as a brutal conqueror and military leader. But this last great monarch of Assyria also repeatedly and proudly boasted of both the depth of his knowledge and the sheer quantity of topics he was versed in. Many palace reliefs of the king include his depiction with a writing stylus tucked into his waist belt as a symbol of his intellectual nature. Over years, Ashurbanipal collected over 30,000 clay tablets authored by himself and by others. When Nineveh was torched by the Medes and Babylonians in 612 BC, the clay tablets were baked harder by the fire and thereby preserved. The wonder of this bounty of Assyrian cuneiform 
is not any specific library structure or grand piece of architecture, but the sheer historical value of the discovery. With the discovery of Ashurbanipal's library, thousands of contemporary texts were discovered, telling the story of the Assyrians in their own words. Containing pieces of such diverse nature as divination, religious, medical and mathematical texts, among the most precious works found among the tablets was the Epic of Gilgamesh, a work of Babylonian poetic genius. In 2021, the British Museum contains over 30,000 of these recovered tablets. Our final wonder is perhaps the most iconic and well-known. So well known that its absence from the list of seven primary ancient wonders often comes as a surprise, the Colosseum of Rome. The story of this Colosseum, known as the Flavian Amphitheatre, is thoroughly bound in the fall of Augustus's Julio-Claudian dynasty and the rise of the Flavians. Under the last Julio-Claudian emperor, Nero, a section of the Roman city centre, annihilated by fire in 64, was extravagantly put back to use with the construction of the emperor's Domus Aurea, or Golden House. But Nero's notorious excesses and insanity eventually resulted in his demise and civil war, which was eventually won by Vespasian. As part of the first Flavian emperor's program of de-Neroization, he gave back to the Roman people Roman land appropriated by Nero for his own personal pleasures. Although a section of the Domus Aurea remained in imperial usage for a long time after, the site of the last Julio-Claudian's nearby private lake was converted into what we now call the Colosseum. Much of the funding for this mammoth project was garnered from the concurrent conquest of Judea, which had been concluded by Vespasian's son Titus. Over the course of a stable Flavian decade, from roughly 70 to 80 AD, the 190 by 155 meter Flavian amphitheater was built in Rome's core with stone and concrete. Its beautiful circular exterior stood three stories tall, each possessing a series of arched entrances supported by semicircular columns. The bottom level possessed columns in the Doric style, followed on the second level by Ionic style columns, crowned by ornate Corinthian columns. Within the structure, there were seats for over 50,000 attendees, who would have been protected from sun and rain as they spectated by a large awning. These spectators would have been gathered to observe gladiatorial combat, mock hunts, wild animal fights, and even staged naval engagements. Popular entertainment of this kind continued for about 400 years, until the oncoming tide of Christianity and the decline of the Western Empire reduced the Colosseum's usage. It suffered earthquakes, lightning, and was eventually abandoned completely, only used as a quarry for other building projects such as St. Peter's Cathedral and the Palazzo Venezia. We're considering covering more wonders in our future videos, so make sure you're subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see the next video in the series. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord, and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.